Good evening. Thank you for coming. This is a photograph that we made today. This is a piece of tungsten, and uh, we etched this on the tungsten. And the, the size of this is about 1 50th of the diameter of a human hair. So very tiny indeed, and this is a very important set of work which they're doing to uh, create appropriate materials for nuclear power stations and fusion and so on. The lab nearby does it with fruit flies, and uh, a neuron, they take the brain out of a fruit fry, and uh, one, one neuron is, is about that size, and so they can get detailed photographs of neurons in a, a fruit fly. The Japanese call them uh, fruit, fly, fl fruit fries. And um, so a lot of uh, extraordinary research going on of different types in, in the Martin School. Anyway, I wanted to talk, talk about something which is not going on in the Martin School today, and that is the subject of the nuclear age, the nuclear weapons age. So I'd like to tell the story of sort of war and peace in the weapons age. So I'll talk for about an hour. I'm sure you'll want to protest and uh, have lots of questions and things like that, but I'll ask you to leave the questions till the end, and then I'll stay as long as you want me to, to, to deal with the uh, questions. Um, so, a very interesting subject. Trinity, as historians look at the history of the world, Trinity will be a very important word. Not because of God, but because of the opposite. Trinity, as I'm sure you know, was the name of the first atomic bomb that was exploded. And shortly after that, Hiroshima was uh, destroyed terribly with the first uh, uranium bomb. The uranium bomb had never been tested. Hiroshima was a test. Something that had never been tested before. Trinity was a plutonium uh, bomb. And um, so Hiroshima, absolute terrible devastation. And uh, what happened to the human beings was absolutely terrible. You very, very often hear politicians making speeches in which they talk about nuclear war as the lights going out. Uh, Obama made a speech uh, recently saying, my country was the first country to explode a nuclear weapon. We would like to be the country that leads the world to elimination of nuclear weapons. And then the public won't have this constant nightmare of suddenly the lights going out. Well, nothing could be more deceptive. Uh, the lights don't go out. You get hordes of people who, those who are still alive, will be tortured in a worse way than any human torture has, uh, has ever existed. There was one woman who described her, her living her child as having a head like a boiled octopus. And they'll live in uh, torture. After the nuclear explosion, there's no possible way of getting anesthetics, no possible way of getting nurses or hospitals. So you can't imagine a hell on earth much worse than what happened at Hiroshima. Except that re really you can. I Einstein said, now we'll be like uh, scorpions in a bottle. And my view of that statement is that the scorpions are real-time computer systems of monstrous complexity. And I've spent quite a lot of my life working with uh, computer systems like that of monstrous complexity for doing very large and highly organized things. For, for a time, I was on the advisory board to the American uh, Department of Defense to talk about uh, software. And uh, anyway, 20, 25 years after... Hiroshima, we had bombs of this size. This is 70,000 times the size of the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima. So you might imagine what that would do in, in New York or London. Uh, it's really far too big. I mean, New York could be destroyed by something much smaller than that. And so if one of those was let off in New York, you'd have uh, maybe 10 million people tortured uh, in, in incredible ways, as well as the smaller number of people who would die in, in the explosion. Now the public don't want to think about this. And so one of the strange things about the story that I want to tell you here is that most people have a defensive mechanism in their brains where they don't want to think about it. Our leaders don't want to think about it. George Keenan was one of the greatest statesmen from America. He was the Russian ambassador. He was the American ambassador to Russia for a long time. And he was famous for the statement, modern governments have become servants of nuclear weapons rather than masters of nuclear weapons. And he went on to say, uh, our leaders are like the victims of some sort of hypnotism. They can't think about nuclear weapons. They're like men in a dream, like lemmings heading for the sea. I sometimes have an image of lemmings heading for the sea where all of the lemmings are wearing PhD gowns. <laughs> anyway, uh, <coughs> re religion as well. Here's uh, a picture of the, the, the current pope. Uh, the Catholic Church became specious, Church of England. I tried to get the Church of England to do something about nuclear weapons, and after quite a long 
argument with a friend of mine who was the Archdeacon of Durham. He eventually wrote to me and said, the church cannot be involved in political matters. This is a political subject. Well, for Pete's sake, it's one of the biggest ethical subjects ever, us having the capability to destroy the lives of such an extraordinary number of millions of people. Anyway, not only were politicians not capable of dealing with it, but the churches weren't capable of dealing with it either. And uh, so nobody seemed capable of looking at the big picture. But there have been a lot of moments during the history of uh, nuclear weapons when we could have fired them. It's almost as though we're playing Russian roulette with uh, civilization. We got very close to a nuclear war and the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, McNamara, the uh, great uh, Secretary of Defense, said that we came within a fraction of a hair's width of, of nuclear war. And at that time, America got 20,000 nuclear weapons, most of them hydrogen bombs. So uh, that's playing Russian roulette. I think perhaps the most dangerous uh, moment was a, a time after that uh, in 1983 when Russia confronted America. So we really want to uh, stop the hypnosis, to stop living in a dream. Um, now, I think of the history that I want to tell as being in uh, four eras. The first era, the Cold War. <coughs> and that was a binary situation. It was America versus Russia, or more broadly, NATO versus the USSR. But it was binary, two great monstrous systems confronting one another. And uh, the Russian Empire ended on Christmas Day in 1991. The Soviet Union ended at that, uh, that time. And uh, then we had more countries with nuclear weapons. So the second era is an era now of nine nations having nuclear weapons, including Israel, North Korea, Iraq, uh, India, um, and uh, small, smaller countries like that. The third era is one which we're really just starting now. If there were to be a, a bad a nuclear uh, state to, today, it probably wouldn't come from nations. It would probably come from what are referred to as non-state actors. A non-state actor might be a, a lunatic terrorist, might be the uh, mafia doing something. So this is the third era of uh, uh, nuclear weapons. And I'd like to refer to it as the amorphous era, a time when anything can happen. But it's not going to follow the nice, precise rules that we had during the Cold War. And the fourth era, uh, we have got to sooner or later eliminate <coughs> nuclear weapons totally. If we don't, we're, we are bound to sooner or later have uh, catastrophes on a grand scale. So a very important question is, can we eliminate them? I, I don't think that would have been a very sensible comment 10 years ago. But now we've reached a point in time where we can see and state in detail what is likely to be the journey to zero nuclear weapons. But almost nobody wants to think about it. It's a very important thing to think about today. Anyway, era one, the Cold War. 1983 was perhaps the most dangerous moment of the Cold War. There was extreme tension between the USA and USSR. The USSR just shot down a civilian airliner, which got an American senator on, on board. <coughs> and um, if a nuclear exchange, it was the view of both sides at that time, if a nuclear exchange is inevitable, you've got to be the one that strikes first. The one that strikes second would be at, at an extreme disadvantage. And so first strike uh, must devastate the capability of the enemy to strike back. So both NATO and the USSR uh, got the capability to do a, an instantaneous uh, strike trying to destroy all the weapons of the other side. And if they could do that instantly, then they had a chance of coming out of the war. People actually use the phrase winning a nuclear war. Of course, you, nobody wins a nuclear war. It would be total devastation on, on both sides. And uh, suddenly NATO put first strike weapons by first strike, I mean these could have destroyed Moscow. And most of the leadership of Moscow was in certain places, some of them on underground. And of course, uh, Americans knew exactly where they were. So these were weapons in Germany, on the far side of Germany, which could destroy Moscow, but particularly of concern for Russians, could destroy the command and control system and the locations where the <coughs> Russian leaders were. And so. The KGB began to think that the Americans uh, were intending to do a first strike. And the first strike was possible. And they had some brutal men uh, at, at the top with this view. And uh, so NATO preparing to do a first strike. Now, it got very tense indeed. And uh, suddenly, uh, both, both America and Russia have uh, lots of sensors. And they can sense the other side firing a weapon. And uh, suddenly. The, the big screens and the massive computers um, suddenly predicted that the Americans had launched 
a weapon at, at Russia. And the man in charge of that was this man, and uh, the launch seemed very strange to him. We, they wouldn't be likely to launch one weapon. And his background was in software, and that persuaded him that almost certainly uh, this was a software error. Now, he knew that if he had, the tension was so great, that if he had formed, uh, informed Ustinov, the Minister of Defense of Russia, then almost certainly there would have been nuclear war. So he uh, violated his orders and did not inform the Minister of Defense or the Politburo that uh, a weapon had been launched. And uh, he thought maybe that was okay because it seemed to be only one. But then the siren went off again and the second one, which the system said a second one was launched. And then a bit later a third one, then a fourth one, then a fifth one, then a sixth one. And it still didn't look real because if American, the Americans were going to launch, you'd get a whole lot launched at the same time. Well, these had got about a two-minute interval between the launches. And this was a um, satellite, set of satellites going around the Earth the, the sun was in such a position that they got a, ref a reflection, which was very unusual, which got into the radar systems and uh, convinced the computers that there was a, a missile attacking. And so anyway, uh, uh, Stanislav Petrov did nothing, did not inform the uh, leadership of the Soviet Union about this, and quite possibly that saved humanity uh, in, in a massive way. He was fired from his job. He lived in extreme poverty afterwards. And then about 20 years later, the West found out about it, and so they invited him to come to the West, and they gave him a prize and referred to him as the man who saved civilization. And so after 20 years of living in poverty, he suddenly became very wealthy because he was a major star because of that happening. Now, if that um, war had happened, something would have occurred that the scientists didn't really know about in 1983. There would have been a nuclear winter. And uh, a nuclear winter means that enormous amounts of debris go up into the uh, sky. Uh, there would be thousands of ground bursts. Hiroshima and Nagasaki were bursts where the weapons were in the air. If you have a ground burst, it's going to throw up enormous quantities of debris. And that uh, debris would uh, uh, be carried around the Earth. It would go through the troposphere up into the stratosphere. The stratospheric winds got about 200 miles per hour, and so they carried all the way around the Earth. And it would get everywhere, and uh, this would result in darkness uh, lasting uh, for at least a year. So you'd have one year with no sunlight, but most of the plants would die. And so this is a, the term of a nuclear winter. At the same time, something else that they didn't know about at that time, uh, with very big weapons uh, like this, many of them, a hundred times the size of the Hiroshima bomb, the weapons would have gone up to the ozone layer, and you'd have got holes in the ozone layer from this happening. And that would have caused the ozone layer, these holes in the ozone layer would have let through ultraviolet B radiation. And ultraviolet B radiation causes cancer and everything. But particularly dangerous, it makes insects blind. So most of the insects underneath the hole in the ozone layer would become blind. If there's no insects, they don't pollinate the, uh, the, the plants and so on. So there's been a lot of study about nuclear winters now. And basically, um, Enormous numbers of people would starve. So if this war had happened, it would have been, it would have destroyed America, it would have destroyed the Soviet Union. But there would have been at least a billion, possibly two billion people uh, dying because of the starvation following a n nuclear winter. So terrible stories. And uh, radioactive fallout would occur all over the world in very remote places. And so a huge aftermath of something like that happening. Now it could have eliminated humanity. And today people have looked back on it and they've done all the calculations. If humanity was exterminated, it would not be because of bombs and explosions, the heat and the radiation. It would be because we damaged system Earth in such a way that the Earth would not be able to support us. We sometimes use the word Gaia for talking about the Earth being like a living thing, incredibly complex system. I like to use the term system Earth meaning that it's a very complex system in the same way that your bodies are, are a very complex system. And in highly complex systems, like your bodies, if something stops working, like your, like your heart or liver, then you, you die from that. Now, there are certain systems that are part of the Earth where if they stop working, then the Earth is going to be very badly damaged indeed and may not be able to uh, support the food and crops that we need for human life. So there's been a lot of discussion about whether you would have exterminated humanity. Nobody's, nobody can be quite sure, but we were so close to that and uh, because the, the Earth would not be able to survive. 
murdering one person is evil, murdering 100 uh, people is perhaps 100 times more evil. One of the worst events, perhaps the worst event in, in history so far is the Holocaust. And there was a meeting in, uh, in 1942 about the Holocaust. And um, a whole lot of top Germans made the decision. Eichmann was in charge of the meeting. He had a detailed meeting. And the conclusion of that meeting was that they would uh, kill 11 million Jews and save the American Jews until after the war. And they argued about how they should do it, how many trains they would need. They were extremely courteous, as Germans often are. There was the most expensive brandy that was provided throughout the meeting. And at the end of the meeting, they took the uh, statement back to Hitler that 11 million Jews would be exterminated. Well, that perhaps is the most e evil event uh, at that time in history. But then, something worse. You cannot fire all of the masses of nuclear weapons by... This time, America and Russia got 70,000 nuclear weapons. You could destroy the Earth with 700. But they got 70,000. And you can't uh, fire 70,000 unless you do it under computer control. And you've got to launch almost all of them at the same time. So there was a massive set of extremely complex systems dealing with aircraft and submarines and every other type of nuclear weapon, ICBMs and, and so on. And, and uh, in order to make that happen, you've got to have a target list. And the target list is in the computers. And uh, if, that, if the American target list had been fired, it would have killed uh, uh, at least 200 million people and it might have killed a billion people with the aftermath of that. So one might say that the uh, PSYOP target list, the original one was drawn up by Donald Rumsfeld. Um, he was the Secretary of State in the Ford administration. And uh, no, e e even more evil than that would be if we exterminated humanity. And uh, exterminating humanity would be they never come back, uh, nothing near in which we can come back. We now have found planets, as I'm sure you know, call them exoplanets uh, around faraway suns. But the thing that the uh, journalists often don't say when they're talking about exoplanets, which might have life, is that the closest one is 20 trillion miles. Not billion, trillion. 20 trillion miles away. So what that is telling us is that we are absolutely and utterly alone. If we eliminate humanity, nothing like it is going to, going to come back again. And so this is a part of the story. So we're playing Russian roulette with civilization. And uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, the uh, planes overhead spotted lots of uh, missiles. And uh, the CIA examined those and it decided that they were nuclear missiles ready to uh, make a, a nuclear launch. Uh, Kennedy announced that to the American public at the time. He announced that I was driving into New York with a highly seductive IBM female executive. And we pulled the car to the side of the road, and she thought this was rather entertaining, rather like being at the movies. She described to me the wonderful fallout shelters that IBM had got. Uh, what America didn't know at that time was that these missiles in Cuba were loaded. They got the weapons on board, and the weapons were ready to instantly fire. And the, they couldn't have reached the west coast of America. They could have reached Chicago. New York would probably have been target number one. New York would have been vaporized in, in doing that. And so there was a, a great uh, showdown. And uh, Bobby Kennedy called the uh, Russian ambassador into his office and uh, confronted him and said, look, tomorrow either you remove those weapons or we remove them. So this was high noon most extreme, more tense, high noon moment than you get in um, movies. Really. There, there was a movie about this, and it wasn't <coughs> nearly, as, nearly as tense as it should have been. And uh, so that was an extraordinary uh, moment. Unfortunately, it worked out OK. The Russian fleet uh, turned back. The Americans fired at it. Uh, one submarine surfaced, and the Americans ordered it to stop, and it took no notice. And so the Americans fired a depth charge. At it. And several depth charges. It must be hell being in a submarine when a depth charge goes off near you. And the captain must have been totally enraged by that. Now, what America didn't know, what nobody in the West knew, is that that submarine had got a nuclear weapon on board. It had got a nuclear torpedo. There were four Soviet submarines at that time which had got a nuclear torpedo. And the captain of the submarine, totally enraged, said, fire the nuclear weapon at the Americans. And he had mutiny on his hands. The second officer refused. The KGB officer said, yes, you must fire. The KGB officer, the first officer, and the second officer had to turn keys at exactly the same instant, and this man refused. And he was told very firmly by the KGB that that was mutiny. In fact, that single event stopped uh, a nuclear war. 
between uh, Russia and the United States. Russia would have been very largely destroyed because America had got about 20,000 uh, missiles. It got a lot more than Russia had, in, in fact. And later on, he was recognized for having done the right thing. So he had a great military career, and as you can see, learned, he earned lots of medals later, later on. But once again, it's, it's Russian roulette. This was right on the edge, Russian roulette situation. Now, all over the world, we have sensors to detect uh, weapons being launched. And these are in Finding Dales in Yorkshire. And there are many of them all over the world. And in the early days, there were fairly simple types like this. Now we've got many different types of sensors, all feeding into the most elaborate computer systems. And the screens on these computer systems indicate if the Russians have fired anything or indicate if uh, America's in, in, in trouble. Uh, the problem with that is if they've fired ICBMs, then by the time they are detected, there's only about 10 minutes left for America to do something. And in that 10 minutes, they've got to wake up the president. So there's a whole mechanism for contacting the president, no matter where he is, uh, what location he is. If he's in Africa, if he's in bed with Monica Lewinsky, you've got to wake him up instantly. And he is the person who would give the order to fire back. And uh, the center of this was Cheyenne Mountain. Cheyenne Mountain, ma massive <coughs> mountain in Colorado. And uh, this door is, uh, weighs 25 tons. Several blast doors going into Cheyenne Mountain. And the whole place is on springs, these enormous springs. Uh, and there are um, 1,300 of these springs. So you've got this huge complex bouncing up and down on springs if a nuclear weapon goes off nearby. And this was the location where they would make the decision that it was necessary to fire their ICBMs and other weapons at the United States. And the people who would fire such weapons have a, a key. There are two keys, and two different people have to turn the key. These individuals are called missile control officers. They're young people. Uh, most of them are graduates, particularly uh, in the age range of about 20 to 25. And they've got just about the most boring job in the world. They have to sit there all day. If the girlfriend asks them what they did for a living, they might say, well, it's my job to fry a million human beings. A innocent, million innocent human beings, if, if the order came through saying that we had to do that. If things went wrong, they, there were planes that could take the same action. So this is a, a plane in the sky again. You've got two keys, so two control staff. And this, the, turning these keys would bypass the uh, Cheyenne Mountain orders and the main missile controls. And so this is the way to start a nuclear war if the ICBMs or the mechanism, control mechanisms have, have been destroyed. The complexity of these systems got worse and worse and worse. And uh, the first thing that would happen is, the, if, if possible, you, you'd vaporize the president and you'd destroy Cheyenne Mountain. You'd do everything you could to destroy the command and control systems. And so there are arcane arguments about, can you uh, launch on warning when you can see the things coming in? Or can you launch before warning? When would you launch before warning? So the systems became very complex indeed. The president had a, a device called uh, the football. In fact, all presidents have a football. The Prime Minister of England would have, and the equivalent in, in Russia, even small countries, had a football. And this has got very elaborate electronic codes and controls in it. And there's a human being who follows the president around uh, everywhere. And this is the device which the president would use for uh, firing, starting for nuclear war or firing back in a nuclear war. When uh, President Reagan was shot, he was bundled into a limousine and uh, the person who was uh, carrying the football, the person sitting next to him was killed in that incident. They bundled him into the limousine as well. So he was standing by the bedside in the hospital when uh, Reagan was uh, slipping down into the anesthetics uh, holding the football. The last thing Reagan said before the anesthetics worked is, I hope you guys are Republicans. <laughs> and uh, anyway, 70,000 weapons by that time. This was a Russian minister of defense, and he made the statement, Future generations that consider history will wonder what sort of madman could have built these weapons. And I think many people in the military have that same view. Today, have that uh, same view about nuclear weapons. Russia is absolutely huge. It, it spreads across 11 and a half time zones. <coughs> Biggest, far the biggest country in the world. It's uh, 45 times the size of Japan, for example. And so the Americans said, we've got to have a lot of uh, nuclear weapons because Russia is so big. And Russia said, we've got to have more nuclear weapons than the Americans do so that we can win the war with them. So these are arguments that happen. 
One uh, rather uh, strange situation was France. France refused to be part of NATO, refused to have any agreements with the Americans at all. <coughs> it, got, it had its own nuclear system. No end of people said, why? Why, why on earth does France uh, want that? And uh, France managed to test one of the biggest hydrogen bombs, and it uh, allowed hydrogen bombs to be tested in the 1990s, long after the USSR had uh, gone away in Tahiti. There were riots in Tahiti as France uh, tested these uh, monstrous weapons. And the president of France, several presidents, uh, assured the French public that uh, only uh, the president could start a nuclear war. He, he got the key. Nobody else could start one but him. And what he didn't tell the public is he's target number one. If anybody attacked France, the first thing they would do is vaporize the president and then destroy the rest of the command and control system. And so there's a word, a technical word in the systems that are built called decapitation. And the goal is that the first strike should begin with decapitation which you take out Cheyenne Mountain, you take out the White House, you take out all of the top officials, the top generals, if you can. And both sides try to do that. Now, Gorbachev came to power, and Gorbachev, maybe more than any, any other uh, people in the Politburo at that time, was a man, I think, of deep common sense. And so he was uh, absolutely horrified by what was uh, happening there. This was the number of Russian nuclear weapons, it went up to that uh, peak of about 40,000, and then it started to come down when uh, Gorbachev came to power. So I'm going to describe the era one and era two. This is the line separating the first era from the second era, and uh, that is the time when the USSR ceased to exist. And once uh, that happened, then uh, America and uh, the Soviet Union became reasonably friendly and made all sorts of agreements that could stop... Uh, uh, a nuclear war happening between those countries. And so suddenly this great danger of America versus Russia ended and we moved into the second era of weapons. The flag came down at uh, 7.35 p.m. on Christmas Day 20 years ago. And uh, now 20 years later, Russia's still got uh, eight... Uh, America's got 8,500 nuclear weapons and Russia's still got 11,000 nuclear weapons, m many of them immensely powerful hydrogen bombs. So you've got to say, if the two countries claim that they're friendly with one another, why on earth, after substantial reductions of weapons, why on earth does Russia still have 11,000 incredibly dangerous nuclear weapons and missiles and all the equipment for, for firing those? And it really doesn't make sense at all. And there are all manner of things in today's nuclear situation which don't make sense. And so this would go back to Keaton's statement about uh, our, our leaders not understanding what is happening, our leaders being in a state of hypnosis, not doing, not taking the actions which are sensible actions to take. There are lots of accidents which happened, and uh, masses of them. There was a time uh, when there were hyd hyd hydrogen bombs overhead, huge planes carrying hydrogen bombs, instantly alert, so that uh, America did, could uh, attack at any moment. And the Russians had these huge planes flying overhead as well for quite a long time. This is a, a picture here of a computer error, um, ICBM rising out of its silo there. In the little village of Lake and Heath in England, they had an American base where they stored a lot of bombs like this, gigantic hydrogen bombs. And an American bomber crashed on landing and crashed into the storage area where these are, are setting. The bomb itself has 8,000 pounds of conventional explosive, <coughs> quite apart from the, the nuclear explosive. And there were lots of stories in the press about... Uh, airmen, including officers, running away from the American base as fast as they could and getting into a, a taxi or getting uh, people in ordinary cars saying, take us as far away from here as you possibly can. But fortunately, the, uh, the explosive didn't, didn't go off. Uh, otherwise, they'd have covered a large area of England with uh, an extremely radioactive substance. Anyway, there are no end of stories like this. This is a, a bomb which dropped on a parachute and got stuck in a tree, a big hydrogen bomb. One of the most extraordinary stories is that uh, America, by accident, dropped four hydrogen bombs on Spain. <laughs> and the Spanish were rather annoyed about that. And um, this is the plane that did it. This is a B-52. And it had to be refueled so that it could stay in the air permanently. So this is a, a tanker uh, refueling the plane, which has got four hydrogen bombs on, on board. And uh, the, the planes accidentally touched each other, a mistake on the part of one of the pilots. And uh, when that happened, uh, there was a spark and the 
fuel caught fire, so this fuel tank blew up, absolutely massive explosion, and the crew was killed. The crew in this plane uh, pressed their ejection seat buttons, so all the crew in this plane lived and floated down to Earth on their parachutes. Well, meanwhile, the hydrogen bombs had dropped. Two of them dropped in the countryside and exploded, but not in a nuclear way, exploded in a conventional way, spreading uh, radioactive stuff all over the soil. And uh, there were about 100 square miles in which for years after that, America was working to remove all of the soil which was radioactive and replace it with new soil for Spain. There was a child walking down the beach and uh, uh, the, the, the new hydrogen bomb had dropped uh, somewhere near the beach, but they couldn't find it. And the child suddenly saw a, a piece of metal sticking out of the beach like this. So he scraped the sand away, wondered what on earth this was, and it was a hydrogen bomb, the fin of a hydrogen bomb. The fourth hydrogen bomb dropped into the sea, and there was somebody in Spain who saw it, but they took a very long time to find it. They managed eventually to get a submersible submarine that found it. But his lawyer advised him that the law of the sea in Spain says that if you see something uh, drop into the sea, then you have the ownership right of that object. So his lawyer told him that he had ownership rights of a hydrogen bomb. And so they got to the States and hired some of the most expensive lawyers that uh, <coughs> advised the Department of Defense, and that got settled out of court. Nobody said how much money it was. Anyway... This was uh, one of the planes involved. Most extraordinary incident mm -hmm. recently, uh, I don't know whether you know the story of the M Minot uh, Air Force Base in uh, North Dakota. And uh, that's an Air Force Base which has a lot of hydrogen bombs. And, of course, you have the most extreme safety controls uh, when you've got hydrogen bombs. For a start, everything in them is coloured red, so you couldn't distinguish a hydrogen bomb or its casing from anything else. And somehow or other... The bombs got taken out of storage. The uh, nuclear fuel got loaded into the bombs. The fuses were set so that the bombs were instantly ready to go off. Six bombs were put onto cruise missiles. The cruise missiles were put under the wing of the plane here. The uh, control panel of the pilot would tell him that the nuclear bombs were on the plane and the nuclear bombs were alert, so they're ready to launch instantly. And that plane flew across the United States about 1,500 miles and landed in the base in uh, Louisiana. And for about a day and a half, it sat there with the hydrogen bombs on, on board, alert. And there had been no, no end of uh, um, quite a huge performance by this, as you might imagine. And the Americans have uh, said it was an accident. In fact, you'd have to have six different accidents which are totally unconnected in order for this to happen. Each one of those accidents having the lowest probability imaginable of, of happening. And now, at uh, that time, uh, Israel had decided to attack a uh, reactor in Syria. And this reactor was protected by the Russians. And they had an extremely uh, powerful air defense system for shooting down planes if they got near to the reactor. And the Israelis, who are pretty clever at cyber warfare, managed to send uh, cyber uh, signals in to disable the Russian system. And so a flight of uh, Israeli planes, about 16 planes went in, destroyed the reactor totally. They found out it was a very dangerous reactor, but making materials which could have led to a Syrian uh, nuclear bomb. The Russians were absolutely furious about this. There was a headline in the Spectator saying uh, the world was on the edge of nuclear war. And prior to that, you had this thing sitting on the base in Louisiana carrying its six hydrogen bombs. Um, well, one shouldn't say any more than that. Th those are the facts. But needless to say, there were spectacular conspiracy theories uh, about what was actually going on at that time. Anyway, many, many stories like this. Era two. Two nuclear nations. This is the first era and the second era. And this is the, the date when they first tested it. And this is the number of nuclear weapons. Israel was maintaining that it had no nuclear weapons. It still maintains that. But it was thought to have 200, probably has 200 nuclear weapons now, and um, North Korea has now got about 10, and uh, Pakistan has got more than India. Pakistan is increasing its numbers of nuclear weapons faster than any other country at the uh, present time. And so this is the cast of characters for the second year where we have nine nuclear weapon nations. China will become an extremely powerful nation indeed, but a very powerful military and it's got both missiles and planes like this for carrying uh, nuclear weapons. It has a 
a small number of nuclear weapons. Um, uh, China, I think, is managed today by a, a Politburo of men who are brilliantly intelligent, very competent, very intelligent. And the, the absolute goal of China, they think this is going to become the greatest country on earth. It was once the greatest civilization on earth. They think it will again become the greatest civilization on earth. So the absolute number one goal in China is there must not be war. The one thing which could stop China's growth is, is nuclear war. So all those systems are designed to avoid nuclear war rather than to win it if it happens. And uh, they put out, had a lot of propaganda. This was a photograph in the press of a stealth bomber, a Chinese stealth bomber. In, in fact, they did build a stealth bomber, but it didn't look anything like this. This was in, uh, a photograph which was intended to mislead the intelligence agencies, and there was a lot of that going on. <coughs> India. Um, set off a, a bomb. The uh, Indian bomb was a plutonium bomb like uh, Trinity. And Indra Gandhi, who was the Prime Minister of India at that time, didn't tell anybody. Her secretary knew. The Minister of Defence didn't know. Nobody knew apart from her personal secretary and the scientists who brought this thing into existence. There were about 16 scientists and they did uh, almost exactly the same as what the scientists on Trinity did, except that by this time they knew exactly what they were doing because they got all the technical uh, details from, from that, that bomb. And uh, so was, amazingly, it was called the Smiling Buddha. India is a Hindu country with lots of Muslims, but almost no Buddhists. Why on earth would they call the atomic bomb a Smiling Buddha? Well, it's nice to have a, a religious word like Trinity. And uh, this occurred um, in, an instant after the bomb exploded. And uh, the camera which took that about 50 milliseconds later, the camera will be, be vaporized. So they took this photograph and then sent, sent it off by uh, wireless. And the uh, countdown was going on, and the uh, test was, uh, the bomb was supposed to be exploded at 8 a.m. in the morning, and they did all the things in the countdown, and they found there was a person missing. So who the hell is it? Somebody's not here. And then somebody decided, it's the photographer who set up the cameras to take this picture. So they put the uh, test on hold, and they went down to investigate, and they found that the photographer's jeep had broken down, and he was running away from ground zero as fast as an Indian cricketer can run. <laughs> and, uh, uh, interesting stories. Uh, in, uh, uh, when India got a bomb, Pakistan got one very quickly, and this was created by a technical genius called A.K. Khan, but it's amazing how fast India got a, uh, an atomic bomb, how many it's, it's getting at the present time. And so uh, Khan was a great hero. But then, in older age, he started to sell the knowledge of how to make bombs to many other countries. And a lot of people said he's selling it to the Muslims. And they called it the Islamic bomb. But North Korea is not a Muslim country. And so he, was, uh, he set up a whole n network. Uh, they called it the Nuclear Bazaar for getting details of how to make nuclear bombs and how to get the enriched uranium that you need for doing it. So he turned out to be a very evil man. Uh, Pakistan has ballistic missiles. It also has cruise missiles, um, which can be fired at India. This is uh, India. If India attacked Pakistan, it would be with fighters uh, like this. India's made uh, brilliant uh, jet uh, fighters. And so you have this tense situation. And uh, India's defense minister ordered 300 uh, Russian fighters uh, for this purpose, fifth, fifth generation stealth fighters. This is in Kashmir. Since India became independent, there have been four wars, and three of them have been uh, over Kashmir. There's a dispute about uh, who owns what in Kashmir. So this war started about uh, this uh, town, this city. Uh, India was claiming it, and Pakistan was uh, claiming it, and that led to a war situation, and uh, eventually the uh, Pakistani Minister of Defense, um, Pakistani President um, Musharraf, uh, said to the Indians, if Indian troops move across the disputed line, India should not expect a conventional war, it will be a nuclear war. And the Indian defense minister responded, if that happens, Pakistan would cease to exist, which it certainly would if India fired its weapons at it. So you've got this belligerence going on. And so probably today the most likely nuclear war that could happen is India versus Pakistan or Israel versus the uh, mostly Muslim countries which could attack uh, uh, Israel. This is the president of uh, 
Iran, <coughs> with a flair for making inflammatory statements, but several other countries periodically make the statement, Israel must be wiped off the map. And they say with no justification whatsoever that the Quran says that India, uh, that uh, Israel shouldn't be wiped off the map. All Jews, Jews should be eliminated from the planet. The Quran doesn't say anything of the sort. In fact, there's a remarkable similarity between the prophet of the uh, Islamic world and uh, Christ. The rather similar man, they made rather similar statements, wonderful philosophers saying, uh, love your neighbours and... Uh, Religions managed to somehow distort the words of the uh, founder in, in fairly serious ways. Anyway, this is the routes going on today about cent centrifuges. These uh, are centrifuges. In order to make an atomic bomb, uh, we have to take uranium which comes out of the ground, which is mostly uranium-235 with a little bit of uranium-238. We've got to increase the proportion of uranium-238. If we're going to build a power station... Uh, nuclear power stations have 3% uranium-238. Uh, uh, the most modern ones have 4%. No, none of them has more than 4%. But uh, Iran has <coughs> got up to 20%, in some cases substantially more than 20%, and that has no use whatsoever in nuclear power. So the only explanation is that Iran is heading in the direction of having wanting to get an atomic bomb. It's certainly got the missiles to deliver an, an atomic bomb. And uh, so there's a lot of argument about the moment with uh, uh, Netanyahu meeting uh, Obama and uh, discussion about uh, bombing uh, Iran. And Obama's trying to tell him not to. And he says, well, we'll give them a few uh, more months. If nothing, this isn't settled within about three months or so, then we are going to bomb Iran. But the important thing to say is that while we know about uh, these... Uh, we don't know about most of them. You can put centrifuges anywhere, and they put a large number of them in a very deep hole in the ground, about 80 metres deep. Oddly enough, the country which makes by far the strongest concrete is uh, Iran. And so they've uh, got underground facilities which conventional explosives couldn't get down that low. And one of them is near the holy city of Qum. This is often regarded in the Muslim world as being the second most uh, sacred city, the first one, of course, being Mecca. And quite close to this, they've got their facilities for uh, making uh, uranium for atomic bombs. And you couldn't destroy them without a nuclear weapon, but nobody's going to use a, a nuclear weapon just close to the world's most second sacred Islamic city. So there's no, really no point in uh, Israel or, or anybody else attacking Iran. They're not going to stop Iran in its progress. The only way we can stop it in its progress is a uh, very elaborate and complex form of diplomacy. And uh, maybe this will happen, particularly if they get a different president from the present one. So Einstein was saying, we're like scorpions in a bottle. Well, the scorpions had all sorts of elaborate technical uh, words associated with them. Decapitation, uh, last resort weapons, launch on warning. The technical consequences of all of these pieces of philosophy are immense. First strike, preemptive launch, uh, computerized deterrence. So you've got massively complex computer systems and a whole uh, philosophy which relates to these computer systems with many millions of lines of code. And uh, where you have systems with many millions of lines of code, it usually goes wrong, all sorts of uh, errors in the code. And when people are developing very complex code, they sometimes talk about the philosophy of a complex system. One of the things that... Uh, software developers worry about is if management changes the philosophy because then you've got to change a whole lot of code to try and keep up with the change of philosophy then the nuclear systems, the philosophy was changing all the time so it was remarkably difficult to get the code that was necessary for these systems which are about the most complex systems that have been built in, in computer science Israel um, is one of the disadvantages of Israel is very small geographically so for uh, nuclear weapons could destroy the whole of Israel. These nuclear weapons could be on cruise missiles or on short-range uh, ballistic missiles. Iran has got both of those, and it's quite likely that some of the <coughs> organizations, including the terrorist organizations that are right on the doorstep of Israel, are going to get missiles with which they can use such weapons. And uh, so Israel has defended itself by uh, ordering the most modern submarines. These come from Germany. They are the most technically advanced submarines that uh, exist, more so than the huge American uh, nuclear submarines. 
and uh, these have got nuclear weapons on board. Israel has no nuclear weapons above ground that could be attacked with the first strike, and you couldn't attack a submarine underwater because you, you haven't the slightest idea where they are. And these uh, submarines are equipped with cruise missiles and ballistic missiles. Now, the, these uh, submarines will be <coughs> in the Mediterranean, in the Persian Gulf, in the Arabian Sea, nobody knows where, but the range of the missiles there is such that uh, one of those submarines could destroy any city in the Arab world or the Iranian world. And in fact, they could destroy all of the cities in, in the Arab world then. And so that means that if you attack Israel, a second strike is going to be utterly devastating and uh, will destroy most, most of the Middle East cities. And so this is a sort of situation that we're living with. And uh, this, is the, um, uh, Gulf, this is the Gulf of Hormuz. And this is the, uh, the big gulf, and about a third of the world's globally traded oil uh, comes, comes from the Middle East, Saudi Arabia and so on, and has to pass through this uh, very, very narrow entrance. And the, 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 the channel is about, only about a mile across here, and uh, you could easily destroy ships going through there. So Iran has threatened to close the Gulf of Hormuz. And that's one of the reasons why the price of oil is $140 today. And uh, one of the ways to do that is with this missile, SSN-22, uh, uh, and that is the world's most formidable anti-ship missile. So it can travel very fast, travel a long distance, and home in. As it gets close to the ship, it zigzags around so that uh, you can't really shoot it down from on board the ship. So this would have no difficulty in shooting down. Uh, Iran would have no difficulty in destroying all of the oil tankers that want to pass through the Gulf of Hormuz. Now, if that happened, it would absolutely be war. It wouldn't be a nuclear war, it would be a conventional war, but who knows, if you have a, a conventional war going on in that part of the world, who knows where you might get to a situation where the person being destroyed decides to use nuclear weapons. And the Pakistani bomb is referred to as the Islamic bomb, and they've got more than 100 of them. And uh, India, this is uh, India. Now, India is growing very fast. It's an extraordinary country at the moment. They're putting an incredible education into place. And it's growing very rapidly. And uh, as people look at what India's plans are, Goldman Sachs says it's going to go up a curve which is approximately the same as China. And it's about 15 years behind China. So China now growing up into a massively powerful economy eventually. And the Chinese would like to say the greatest civilization in the world. Well, India's doing the same. And uh, India eventually will have a higher population than China. China is totalitarian, whereas in India has got uh, uh, democracy, it's got uh, British rule. China hasn't got formal accounting, whereas uh, India has the formal accounting that we have in the West. So one wonders whether 30 years from now will India be a more successful economy than China. And nobody can know, but it's, it's on the cards that it might be. But here's Pakistan. Pakistan has got more nuclear weapons than than India. And uh, the further India goes in developing its empire, the more dangerous this becomes because there's more to destroy. So India trying to build up this in incredible empire of the future, magnificent civilization of the future, if all goes well, has got this threat hanging over it of the Pakistanis who are militarily and politically highly unstable, having got more than 100 uh, nuclear weapons. So the only sensible thing to, for India to do is to do anything, take any negotiation, any path possible to persuade uh, the Middle East to uh, uh, disarm nuclear weapons, get rid of the nuclear weapons in, in Pakistan and, and, and India. China is supporting Pakistan because China would like to be a bigger empire than India. And so India has brought a lot of <coughs> spectacular fighters, more impressive than the present American fighters, which uh, Pakistan has got. So... Anyway, this is the second era. Now, if there was a war in the Middle East, it would probably involve 200 to 300 nuclear weapons. And if you got that number of nuclear weapons being fired, you would get a nuclear winter. And so there have been very detailed studies of uh, a nuclear winter of that size. It wouldn't be nearly as bad as the nuclear winter of America and Russia, but it would probably destroy all uh, crops for one year. So if you had a nuclear winter for one year on Earth, enormous numbers of people would die of starvation. So a war in the Middle East might cause uh, a large number of deaths in the Middle East, but possibly a billion people around the planet 
to uh, die of starvation and all of the other effects of uh, a nuclear winter, including holes in the ozone layer letting through ultraviolet B radiation. And uh, so, uh, terrible situation. Now, the great philosopher of war that everybody teaches, one of the first things you talk about at the military colleges at Sandhurst or West Point is uh, von Clausewitz. And von Clausewitz was the great philosopher of war, and it was his view that war is the extension of politics by other means. In other words, when politics has gone far enough and it's not getting you what you want, then you, you go to war. And so for a long time, that has been sort of the base, basic rule of war. But today, the only sensible thing to say is there's no possible political objective that can justify nuclear war. A nuclear war would uh, destroy the participants totally. And that. so, goodbye von Clausewitz. We've moved into a totally different era. And um, so this is uh, a, a very important change. And we've moved into a time where there'll either be no war between high-tech nations or else there'll be no civilization. If you had a conventional war, I suppose you had World War II now, and Germany had got an atomic bomb. There's no question that when Berlin was being utterly destroyed, uh, Germany would have used its atomic bomb. And that's bound to be the case. There's a conventional war where the participants have got nuclear weapons. As they get destroyed in the conventional war, they're almost bound to use the nuclear weapons. And so we can't really afford to have a war uh, that's uh, like the Second World War, uh, any, any war like that. We can have a war where a powerful country destroys a small country that can't fight back, like Iraq. And we're going to get lots of wars in Africa. They, they enjoy having wars there, and they haven't got very powerful weapons. But you cannot any longer have war between high-tech nations, even high-tech nations which haven't got nuclear weapons yet. So I tend to think this is the most extraordinary paradigm shift. I, uh, I've never been trained in history, but I suspect that this is the biggest paradigm shift in history. It's an absolutely enormous change. And it has no end of implications for the development of civilizations. The world is becoming totally global now. And so we are, are moving painfully and slowly with lots of mistakes towards a world which will be a, a, a global world in which people eventually learn to respect one another. The Muslims and the Christians learn to uh, respect each other's uh, religions. And so very, very uh, important change that we're in the middle of at the present time. Very, very exciting set of uh, changes. And uh, now, war uh, um, is a way to solve problems. If you've got a dispute and you can't solve them by politics, you solve them by war. So if we've got this situation where you can't have war, then there must be some other way to settle disputes. In fact, there are many. The World Court in The Hague has very detailed rules about warfare and uh, things which uh, lead to war. And so you've got the World Court, you've got the World Trade Organization. The head of the World Trade Organization is lecturing in Oxford tomorrow. And uh, you've got no end of global, very, very large numbers, many thousands of global regulations, which uh, mean treaties which countries have signed. So enormous numbers of treaties, many of them being global treaties, global laws, uh, the World Trade Organization being involved with many of these global laws and treaties. And uh, now you've got to make sure that people are obeying the rules. And so you need verification techniques. And so if we're moving to a state where we've got very few nuclear weapons, you want to make sure that uh, um, one country isn't secretly building nuclear weapons. And the good news is we've got incredibly advan advanced verification techniques. Most of the, the really advanced ones coming from the National Security Agency in the United States and involving the most enormous computer systems. And so the uh, National Security Agency is capable of telling just about anything that uh, is going on in America now with Americans. And one of the reasons why uh, it's doing that is it got in an awful lot of trouble. They looked at all the email messages that they picked up before 9-11. The day before 9-11, there were lots of email messages saying, tomorrow is the day. Tomorrow is the day when the great country will be destroyed. Uh, no end of email messages like that. On uh, September the 10th, the Mayo Clinic is the, probably the best uh, clinic for dealing with uh, ailments like cancer, serious ailments. And a lot of Saudis were going there. On September the 10th, every Saudi patient left the Mayo Clinic. On September the 11th, all flights were closed down. No flights were allowed in the sky except Saudi flights, which flew back to Saudi Arabia. Anyway, because of that, the National Security Agency uh, got the message, and that's that you've got to build up 
a highly elaborate computer systems for watching everything that's going on, which could possibly indicate that there's future terrorism taking place. And in my view, they've done the most spectacular job of, of, of achieving that. Okay, era three, the amorphous <laughs> era, an era in which anything goes. And what I mean by anything goes is if there was a nuclear situation, it would probably be non-state actors, actors that are not part of a nation. They could be large non-state actors like the mafia, or they could be individual uh, terrorists. Freeman Dyson, an absolutely wonderful English uh, physicist who had a lot to do with um, nuclear weapons. He's at the uh, School for Advanced Studies at Princeton. And he likes to set his students the uh, job of saying, I want you to design an atomic bomb. Now, you can find out where the material is. I'm not going to give you any clue about how to design it, but you've got four weeks now, and I want every one of you at the end of four weeks to come back with a working design for an atomic bomb. And almost all of them succeed in doing that. And one student told him that it was too easy, and so he gave this student the job of, OK, design a simple hydrogen bomb, which is a lot more difficult. And the student succeeded in doing that. And instantly, his paper was classified by the National Security Agency. I think it's probably one of the first examples where um, term papers have been classified by the uh, intelligence agencies. Anyway, brilliant man. But the use of an amateur atomic bomb is fairly easy to make if you've got the advanced uranium, the highly enriched uranium. The thing which is saving us is that most people who might do this haven't got the fuel, haven't got the uh, enriched uranium that we need. But it could m be m create much more devastation than Hiroshima, because Hiroshima was a fairly small bomb that was uh, exploded in the air, and these could be large bombs which are exploded on the ground. So they'd throw out the most incredible quantity of debris. You might have seven amateur bombs, all of which are exploded at the same instant with a radio signal. And if that happened in Los Angeles, for example, the whole of Los Angeles would become a, a blazing ruin with the heat from all the bombs forming one column of fire, rising very fast. The winds would be 400 miles per hour. If there were human beings 10 miles away from where it happened, the human beings would be blowing through the air at uh, 400 uh, miles per hour. So devastation, which is unbelievable. And that can be done now with amateur atomic bombs. And so we're reaching a time. Well, this is just too dangerous. And so we've got to take very seriously the issue of getting rid of them, getting rid of the fuel of which we can make them. This man uh, created a cruise missile. He became famous for building a cruise missile. He, was old. he lives in New Zealand. The uh, New Zealand government doesn't take him seriously, but nevertheless, he, he did that, and it was indicating that it's quite possible for other people to uh, create the missiles that would carry such bombs. There's a sort of Moore's law of nuclear weapons. The biggest hydrogen bomb was this one, and now you can get a hydrogen bomb which you could send by UBS, and so the smallest hydrogen bomb. The one which is probably the most commonly manufactured is 11 and a half inches across, and uh, this uh, is uh, 12 times Hiroshima, hydrogen bomb, 12 times Hiroshima. And the reason why it's uh, cylindrical and thin is that it goes into cruise missiles like this. Probably the best builder of cruise missiles is India. The reason for that is cruise missiles need incredibly complex software because you want them to go down near the earth and uh, go through the valleys, avoid all the radar and, and so on. That is very difficult, very complex software. And the Indians are, are geniuses. Uh, software. Um, software is something you can measure all sorts of measurements, function points, function points for person, many, many measurements. And by all of those measurements today, Indian software is better than American software. So they've become extremely good at that particular activity. And because of that, they built cruise missiles, which are extremely good. There's no need for ICBMs. You could carry a hydrogen bomb and donkey cart. And so there are lots of ways of getting them into place. Now, the warning time used to be 12 hours. Do you remember when there were movies like Dr. Strangelove, where the war room had a ceiling remarkably like this one? And uh, uh, <coughs> movies like Failsafe. And that was because bombers took 12 hours to get from Russia to America, or, or vice versa. And uh, then we got the ICBM. And the early ICBMs, the time was um, about 35 minutes. You probably wouldn't detect them until about, until about 10 minutes into the flight. And so we had 25 minutes warning time. <coughs> And then we got faster missiles, and missiles which could be on destroyers, and the warning time dropped to about 15 minutes. This means that by the time you detect them, you've got 15 minutes. 
to uh, wake up the president or contact the president and get the president to make what must be the worst decision any president can have to make, and that is whether or not to launch uh, America having uh, today uh, 18,000 nuclear weapons and uh, the decision to launch those an unspeakable decision. And uh, then we got things much closer. You could now have uh, ships, and they could be cargo ships, uh, off the coast of Washington, which could get a small missile going into Washington uh, in a time of four minutes or possibly less than four minutes. So your warning time was becoming very tiny. And now we can have a situation where the warning time is, is zero. And so this uh, change here makes the whole situation incredibly more dangerous. How can it be zero? Well, if a terrorist wanted to destroy Manhattan, the easiest way to build the bomb would be to hire a, an expensive apartment in a building which has very high security and take all the uh, pieces into the apartment, make sure the doorman is well tipped and, and build the, the bomb up there. And that's quite easy to do. And then have it in a broom closet where nobody's likely to detect it. You could put it in a bath full of paraffin and that would stop it uh, transmitting any radiation which the authorities could pick up and then you'd detonate it in place. So zero warning time. Or you could have it on a train. Train here rushing into Tokyo perhaps with a, uh, a bomb on board which is designed to be detonated when it gets to Tokyo. And so we have really have a very fundamental change in, in warfare. So the Joint Chiefs of Staff now are confronted with situations which they don't really like. Uh, in the next war there's no battlefield. Uh, many of the weapons will be robot weapons. Uh, ten years ago, all the generals were saying, we don't want robots in warfare. Warfare is about human courage. And you go to West Point to learn human courage, and robots have no courage at all. Now, the same generals are saying, we want the maximum number of robots we can possibly get. And the way you can make really big money in venture capital at the moment is by building new types of robotic weapons for the Department of Defense. Autonomous robots, which means that under certain circumstances, the robot has got the intelligence to decide what it does of its own. It, it's autonomous. Cyber warfare, uh, meaning warfare where you're interfering with electronic systems, uh, nuclear terrorism, non-state enemies. So this is a totally different world for the military, and it's very uncomfortable with it. And uh, the military tradition is saying, but being about human courage, now the war becomes almost like a video game. Somebody sitting in a, a, a room like this, uh, accessing a, a predator. And the cameras on the predator are quite in, incredible. They can recognize somebody's face from the plane that's uh, up there. If the face is a recognized terrorist, then they can destroy that individual, and that would be murder. The CIA is not allowed to murder an individual. So the CIA goes to the president, and uh, in the uh, two years, that, uh, or three years that Obama has been uh, there, he's made many decisions to murder, uh, to kill uh, large numbers of terrorists and people on the other side. There's almost always massive collateral damage. You may kill the person you're after, but you probably kill another 20 or 30 people at the same time. This is what war is becoming like. This is a uh, British uh, uh, plane and uh, designed to go around the world, designed to be uh, travel at many times the speed of sound, uh, designed to be autonomous, designed to kill. And uh, if there was a blitzkrieg, they're having a great time. Now, you remember uh, in, uh, in 1939, Germany designing a blitzkrieg, and the phenomenally successful blitzkrieg where the German armies moved across Europe. Well, what would a blitzkrieg look like in the future? It begins with an absolutely massive cyber attack in which you knock out the computers to the other side or interfere with the computers in any way you can. And uh, you've got thousands of land robots, thousands of drones, air, air uh, robots, submarine-based uh, missiles, autonomous cruise uh, missiles, um, military intelligence becoming very powerful, military artificial intelligence, and all of the operations being integrated. So this is the Predator, the various or, or robot weapons. These, these are weapons with no human on board being uh, operated from a control station far away. And uh, this thing goes at 20 times the speed of sound. And uh, the United States is buying 2,400 of, of uh, the, the new type of fighter there. It's an incredible cost, 382 billion just for this one type of plane. Uh, and yet the education system in, in the schools is going to pieces in the States. 
and uh, the, the uh, pilot here can see through the plane. If he looks around, the electronics enable him to see through. The, the, the body of the plane wasn't actually there. So the most elaborate uh, electronics and these things. And the Blitzky control from one or maybe multiple control centers. The command and control system in the old days used to be in Cheyenne Mountain or one location where that location be, can be destroyed. Now it's distributed. Just like we have distributed computer systems in business, so we have distributed command and control systems. This is the Urals in Russia, and there are many locations in, in the Urals. Now it's about uh, 1, 100 miles from Moscow, uh, millions of square feet underground, and so you really couldn't destroy that with weapons. Now, a command and control system being distributed and consequently virtually impossible to destroy. Okay, all of that is far too dangerous to make sense. And so era four, uh, the era of a journey towards elimination, a journey to zero. An extraordinary event happened at uh, Reykjavik in Iceland. Uh, Gorbachev had um, met uh, Reagan for the first time and um, they sized each other up as being men of common sense, which was very different from many of the earlier uh, leaders in, in, in Russia. And uh, so Reagan said, look, I, I'd like to talk to you on your own. Let's go for a walk in the woods anywhere. Let's get rid of all these minders, all these people recording, all these people telling us what to do. And so they decided to meet in, in Reykjavik, which is a fishing village in Iceland. And uh, Gorbachev says, what's this all about? Why did you want to get together? And uh, uh, Reagan says, well, I'd like us to talk common sense. And Gorbachev says, that's illegal in Russia. And uh, uh, Reagan says, look, I wake up in the morning. I can't sleep at night. I wake up in the morning knowing, it's, knowing that it's my job to press a button which could destroy everybody in Russia. And I can't sleep with that. And Gorbachev says, I'm, I'm absolutely exactly the same. I can't sleep with it. We've got the same job. So there was one day, and during that day, they came to the decision that they would make their countries abolish all nuclear weapons of every type. Every type of warhead, cruise missiles, everything, all of them. And the most incredible panic happened in the Politburo and in the um, uh, Defence Department. You can imagine the four-star generals just about having hysteria <laughs> when they hear that these uh, decisions have, have been made by Gorbachev and Russia. And those decisions could have held, except that the next day Gorbachev came back and said, there's one problem, and that's that you've got... Uh, SDI, you know, the capability to shoot missiles out of the sky. And if you built SDI, Reagan had described it as a like an umbrella which could protect America from systems. And uh, Gorbachev says, if you've got that and we haven't, then you could do a first strike on Russia and we, we couldn't hit back. So I want to do everything we agreed about yesterday, but you must get rid of SDI. Now, R Reagan's background was in the film industry, and the one thing he absolutely would not give up was uh, SDI, and he just stuck with that. And uh, so this uh, very friendly meeting ended up in um, a bad situation where Reagan, talking to the public about it, says, uh, describing SDI, says, this isn't about war, it's about peace. It isn't about retaliation, it's about prevention. It isn't about fear, it's about hope. And if you'll forgive me, using a line from a film, the force is with us. And he refused to give up SDI. And so they, they left that meeting. Uh, uh, Gorbachev said to Reagan, you could have been the greatest president in American history. You could have gone down in history as the president that got rid of nuclear weapons. And now you've lost that opportunity. And uh, Reagan said, exactly the same is true of you. And they parted in, in misery from that meeting. Anyway, extraordinary event. Now, we did get the START treaties, which lowered the number of nuclear weapons. START II was abandoned. This one's just been signed now. But they're not very advanced. This is uh, Senator Luger with a, a, a missile called Satan. And America get to, agreed to get uh, rid, or uh, Russia agreed to destroy its Satan weapons. But the reason they were doing that is that they got a much better one. And so this one has been built since the USSR collapsed. It's incredibly expensive. Russia, a country where most people are living in poverty, spent an absolute fortune on building this new, very advanced type of missile. So the ones that the Russians were destroying were the ones they wanted to get rid of anyway. And so the START treaties ignored uh, thousands of battlefield nuclear weapons. So the START treaties have uh, less than the number of weapons to a certain extent, but they haven't taken us very far on the journey to zero. 
misses the number of weapons on both sides. Now, what one might hope is that with continuing progress, the curves might come down like that, uh, maybe eliminating nuclear weapons totally, perhaps by 1945. That means you've got a 100-year history, Trinity at the beginning, and then 100 years later, uh, you get rid of, of nuclear weapons completely. Let's, let's, let's hope that that can happen. There's a test ban treaty, comprehensive test ban treaty, which they argue about. I like this photograph. Have you ever seen more self-satisfied, happy-looking people than those three? They have a cake, which they're just cutting, which is in the shape of a hydrogen bomb explosion. And they've just um, uh, exploded. Uh, the biggest hydrogen bomb ever so far, totally destroying the uh, area called uh, Bikini. Uh, the French had uh, got a new uh, two-piece bathing suit. They wanted a dramatic name for it, and so the French... Uh, called that bathing suit a bikini after, after that uh, atomic bomb. Now today, uh, the nuclear test ban treaty almost makes no sense at all because scientists don't test weapons by exploding them. They test weapons by simulating them in a computer. And you can simulate them in the most immense detail. And that is the biggest supercomputers in the world. The, the Chinese built uh, w w a machine which for a moment was the largest supercomputer in the world. The main purpose of that was for testing uh, nuclear weapons. And uh, so 5,000 trillion operations per second in the computers which are doing this testing. And uh, so anyway, uh, nuclear weapons are now becoming very dangerous. They might, you might have a, <coughs> a small state, a crazy leader, religious group threatening Armageddon. You might have a cult or a crackpot or... A, uh, a climate liberation army finding there's no, no other way to stop carbon. Um, so a mafia-like organization, global terrorist organization. I think we're going to get intellectual terrorists. Almost all terrorists so far have been stupid. We haven't really seen an intelligent terrorist. I was at a meeting where the head of MI6 was there, and I wasn't sure whether he wanted to talk to somebody like me, but as soon as I used the word intelligent terrorist, and he wanted to have that conversation. It's interesting talking to intelligence people. It's a one-way conversation. You can say all sorts of things to them, but they never tell you anything that they want to. And, uh, but uh, we're going to get intellectual terrorists, which could do a very large-scale market manipulation with these weapons, with the goal of making the largest fortune ever made by global uh, market manipulation. And who knows uh, what uh, somebody like him is going to do with, uh, with, with nuclear weapons. And uh, so it's becoming a, a very dangerous world. We can only be safe if we eliminate these things. Much more is needed than the START treaties. We need a journey to zero. And so era, era four, then, is for eliminating nuclear weapons. Now, uh, one thing that can make a country safer is to not have any first strike targets. And Britain did, Britain did something which I think is courageous and exactly the right thing to do. It said, let's remove all first strike targets from Britain. No nuclear weapons above ground. We'll put all the nuclear weapons in, in submarines. So Amer Britain now has got a great force of nuclear weapons, but no first strike targets. These are all first strike targets in the United States. These are all IBM, ICBM sites. And there are many others uh, like that. And um, they're Minuteman missiles. Minuteman means they can be fired in a minute. So they're solid state rockets. You don't have to <coughs> load fuel onto them. And America has an enormous number of those. All of them are first strike targets which is, doesn't make any sense at all. And uh, this is one uh, ex-ICBM site where they planted these types of sunflowers all over the site. The one um, machine for the delivering systems which nobody could find, it's not a first strike target because you can't find it, is a submarine. And the biggest American submarines are absolutely huge. The British ones are pretty good. The British ones uh, could fire missiles 8,000 8, miles, so Britain could destroy most of the cities in the world with the submarines that it's, it's got uh, here. There's a picture of one of them. It's interesting, if you uh, had a, a nuclear war and the crew is in the submarine and they've got the final message there, uh, are they going to fire back? If they know that uh, the, the nuclear war is over, why would they fire? It would seem immoral to fire at that point. Uh, to needlessly kill people. So probably most of the captains of submarines have got some island in the South Pacific which they picked out where they say, if that's the point it gets to, we'll take our men there, we'll build a new colony, have great fishing, 
Um, by the way, let's ask the government if it will have female of, uh, officers as well as male officers on, on submarines. And just recently, the Americans were the first female onto submarines. The military mind is tough as hell. This was in the Cuba Missile Crisis. This was Curtis LeMay. And uh, the ex-con committee just trying to decide what to do about the terrible situation in Cuba. Curtis May kept uh, leaning on the president of the United States and said, if you don't invade Cuba now, this will be the biggest defeat in American history. And this is uh, the force that you get from the, the most powerful of the military mind. He was the head of Strategic Air Command, which is very powerful. He was another head of Strategic Air Command. And uh, he's famous for the statement, if at the end of the war there are two Americans and one Russian standing, then we have won. And quite contrary to that, you've got the United Nations. And the United Nations is basically feeble. It doesn't understand the technology. It's mostly still arguing about the first era. has not much to say about the second era and has never heard of the third era of nuclear weapons. It uh, cannot make decisions. It cannot enforce decisions. And then you've got the military uh, intellectuals, like McNamara was. He's dead now. And uh, McNamara s said before he died, the uh, US nuclear policy is immoral, illegal, military unnecessary, and, and dreadfully dangerous. And he was one of the most brilliant brains in the old days in, in building the philosophy of mutually assured destruction. And uh, here's uh, McNamara again saying, each decision we had to make in building systems looked right by itself, but all of the decisions didn't fit in to an overall plan. So this led to nuclear arsenals and nuclear computers and computer systems, which nobody wanted and nobody wished to support. And this is, this is what has happened. The world is full of incredibly expensive systems, which today don't make sense, and no, nobody wants them. And this is Kissinger saying, the greatest da danger of nuclear war lies not in deliberate actions of wicked man, but in the ability of harassed men so that they're unable to manage the events which have run away with them. Probably the most uh, intellectual man in the, in the nuclear world was General Lee Butler, and he was at uh, West Point, and he was teaching the courses on, on military strategy. So he knew everything about military strategy. He was absolutely brilliant on that subject. And then he became a, a, a pilot uh, whose job was to fly missions over the Soviet Union to drop hydrogen bombs. He then became the head of Strategic Air Command in charge of all of the planes that would be bombing the Soviet Union. He then became responsible for if the president uh, presses the button on the football, he would be the man who uh, implemented that. And, uh, and then he looked at the target list. He looked at every single target on the American target list, about 12,000 targets. And he said, this is the most grotesque, irresponsible war plan that has ever been designed by man. And that is probably the most intelligent of all of the American leaders on this subject. So the tide is changing very strongly. Uh, Hyman Ricker was one of the most legendary admirals in history. He was the person who invented nuclear submarines. He got the first nuclear reactor to operate and uh, was responsible for all of the American nuclear submarines coming into existence. There's a submarine called uh, uh, the Hyman Rickover. So a very famous man. And uh, recently he retired. When he retired, he uh, had a congressional meeting in which he said, sink all of them, sink all the submarines that I've built. I should never have done it. They're evil. Ground the planes, destroy the missiles, dismantle all warheads. Uh, as long as those exist, America is not secure. The only thing which makes America insecure is the possibility of nuclear war. So you're getting, getting now some of the top most brilliant uh, men in the military. These people are referred to as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Those are all advocating that we should go on a, a journey to zero. There's a huge argument about it. Now, a huge amount of research is, is needed for this. And so I think about Oxford and the research that we're doing at the Oxford Martin School. It's not touching the subject of nuclear weapons, and perhaps Oxford won't. But uh, what are the stages in a journey? How do the stages work? Uh, what are advanced verification techniques? These are intellect-intensive subjects and need a lot of research. Uh, international cooperation methods, uh, developing the, uh, world, with the world court laws that deal with this, uh, drafting elimination treaties, uh, protection from cyber attacks. So here we've got a whole body of uh, knowledge which needs an intense research. And this will be part of the job of trying to get from here to zero. 
And so we can now, in the state world, there should be no war between advanced nations. But does this mean we're moving into a new renaissance? Well, the world has got lots of problems. But you look at the things that we've got in technology, the things which are good, the things which we're now becoming capable of, we're going to greatly increase the uh, average age of life, greatly increase the quality of life. So I believe we have got within our hands now the capability to build a much better world, a much better society than we've had in the past. But we should understand, we should understand that the 21st century can be absolutely magnificent, providing we survive. And uh, so we need to stop the hypnotism, stop the, uh, get to reality instead of dreaming in the public and uh, people who lead the public, uh, stop the lemmings from heading to the sea, stop the Russian roulette. So that's the message.